Pulse Institute. Uh, this is Detroit's independent anti-poverty think tank, um, headquartered here in America's largest black city. Uh, we wanna welcome all of you who are tuning in from across the nation, who have decided to join us this evening for the launching of the force of its kind a national black church lecture series named after the Reverend Solomon Kenlock of Detroit, senior pastor of Triumph Church uh, here in Detroit. Uh, before we begin, I wanna introduce uh, the president and director of research here at the Pulse Institute, attorney Tina Patterson. Uh, she runs the day-to-day -day operations. She is the president and director of research here at this independent anti-poverty think tank here in the city of Detroit an accomplished lawyer, a social justice advocate, and one who continues to speak truth to power for the thousands of black folk here in America's largest city, unafraid, unbought, unbossed, and one who carries within her the spirit of Shirley Chisholm. Attorney Tina Patterson is gonna give us the opening remark here and introduction as we begin this luncheon of this black church lecture series. Thank you and thank you all for being here. Good evening. Uh, thank you for attending tonight's event. I think it's absolutely fitting that we are hosting the first of this kind of event on the day after the 53rd anniversary of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. while we were memorializing him on this day. Uh, the fight for equality, for civil, economic, and human rights for African Americans in this nation uh, has always firmly been rooted in the Black church. Historically, the Black church has served not only as a temple of spiritual sanctuary and salvation, but also as a mighty institution to fight against political iniquities, the forces of racism, and to advocate for social economic equity for Black people in this country. Uh, today, we find ourselves facing much of the same challenges that Dr. King and other spiritual leaders of his time faced. Uh, war, poverty, racism, economic injustice, it's all here once again. Uh, we see how the Black church has responded to these human tragedies in the past. And today, we will discuss how the Black church of our time, this modern time, will and should respond to secure hard-fought liberties earned by our ancestors, such as Dr. King and others. Thank you for your participation. Uh, please enjoy and walk away with a renewed faith and inspiration uh, in what we can accomplish. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Tina. Again, you're listening. This is the Pulse Institute um, National Black Church Lecture Series launching here in the Motor City. The, the headquarters, if you will, uh, the largest black city in the nation. To those who are tuning in from across the country, I saw folks uh, coming in from the United Kingdom. Welcome and thank you for being here, taking your time to be here across the entire black diaspora here. Uh, at the Fox <laughs> Institute, um, our board of directors on behalf of our chairman, of course, uh, C. Pascalese and the members of the board. And of course, also our national advisory panel uh, made up of individuals who we believe, you know, bring a century of anti-poverty work and transformation through the Institute here. In fact, most recently, just a few days ago, we announced uh, Bishop Charles Edward Blake Sr., uh, presiding Bishop Emeritus of the Church of God in Christ as the latest uh, member of our national advisory panel. And in his own words, uh, Bishop Blake said, those who are blessed must bless others and said, I'm proud to serve here at the Pulse Institute National Advisory Panel. Uh, of course, now for the uh, welcome remarks and the invocation, uh, this is a Black Church lecture series, so Reverend Kenlock, we're not going to miss the need to go in prayer at some point here, even though neither Tina nor I are ordained ministers here, but uh, Reverend uh, Lawrence T. Foster, senior pastor of the Calvary Baptist Church, a man trained at uh, Ebenezer's, Martin Luther King Jr.'s Ebenezer Church in Atlanta from Morehouse to Harvard. Uh, I call him a bad brother, uh, Reverend Lawrence Foster, an intellectual to the core, an activist to the core, and we are glad and honored that he is one of the members of the National Advisor Panel here at the Pulse Institute, and we've called on Reverend, Leon, Reverend, Reverend Lawrence Foster to give us the, uh, the welcome remark and the invocation so we can appropriately 
uh, begin uh, this journey. Uh, tighten your seatbelt because this flight is taking off. Do we have Reverend Forster on? All right, so let's move the program going here. Um, one of the things I wanna say before I, I invite Reverend Kenlock to give the acceptance um, uh, remark here, um, many questions have been asked about the modern day black church. Uh, many questions have been asked about uh, whether the church is relevant. And uh, we feel that that question is appropriately answered by those who in fact are within the church, uh, those who are leading the church itself. And that's one of the reasons why we've launched, we've established this Black Church lecture series. Uh, when you look around the globe, uh, the history of liberation movements, when you look all the way in South Africa, uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, serving as a spiritual advisor of the anti-apartheid uh, movement uh, all the way in South Africa. When you look at the United States, when you look at the work of the, work of the late Ken Hope Felder, the longtime dean of Howard University. When you look at the work of the late uh, James Cohn, uh, the longtime professor at uh, the Union Theological Seminary, Black Theology, Black Power. When you look at Latin America, when you look at the work of the, 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 the Peruvian philosopher and theologian, uh, Gustavo Gutierrez, uh, these are men who believe that the church has an important role to play. And when you look at Detroit, uh, we do have uh, churches that are at the forefront of asking some tough questions. And one of those churches uh, here in Detroit is Triumph Church that is pastored by Reverend Kenlock, who in our opinion represents uh, the future of the black church. Uh, looking at what Archbishop Desmond Tutu was able to do, looking at what uh, James Cone has written about black power and black theology, uh, looking, at, looking at what the theologian uh, Ken Hope Felder has written about, troubling biblical waters, looking at what the, the writings of Gustavo Gutierrez, uh, all of their writings really culminate upon a fundamental question, and that is, do black lives matter? Do lives of people of color matter? And that is what we are seeking to uh, answer uh, with this Black Church Lecture Series. And that's why we've named it after Reverend Solomon Kenlock, who has demonstrated in many, many ways, in beyond measure, uh, that the church must not be a sleeping giant and the church must use its influence, must use its power and must use all within to address the needs of people, not only within the church, but outside of the four corners of the church. I'm gonna now invite Reverend Solomon Kenlock to give us an acceptance remark as we begin this program. True forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne, but in the dim unknown stands God in the shadow keeping watch of his own. Uh, first of all, I want to pause uh, to give reverence rights and respect uh, to the editor-in-chief and also the dean of the Post Institute. And that is uh, that fierce fighter uh, who continues to speak, uh, not just for all of us, but particularly for the least, the left out and the left behind and those that feel at times that they don't have a voice or they are not being heard. And so we take our hat off uh, to Bengalay Thompson. Also, I take my hat off uh, to uh, this tremendous visionary leader, attorney Tina Patterson, uh, for her visionary and trailblazing leadership, uh, particularly in a season uh, where we need our individual leaders. Not to be on the sideline, uh, but rather to be on the field uh, making of uh, the progress uh, that is necessary and essential in our community. Uh, as I pause, not only to give reverence to them, but also to those of you that share this virtual platform, I cannot help tonight but to remember that picture, that portrait uh, that was in Alex Haley's office uh, that had a turtle on a fence post. And that picture read, when you see a turtle on a post, uh, you already know uh, that it did not by itself. I have to admit that the fact of my life 
has been woven together uh, with the thread of my experience. I grew up in a neighborhood where Hartford Memorial and Pastor Charles Adams uh, was a block over from me on Hartford and Milford. I grew up in a neighborhood up the street was Tabernacle and Reverend Dr. Frederick Sampson. Uh, I was right down the street from Bishop Earl J. Wright and others who understood that the ministry and the message uh, was to be preached and articulated in a way uh, not just for an individual, but for an entire community of people. As I sit here today, I'm reminded of those words uh, that many times, uh, Bengalay, you often talk about that letter that Dr. King wrote uh, in the Birmingham jail. But there's something that jumps out at me. He said, the judgment of God is upon the church like never before. If today's church does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, it will lose its authenticity, forfeit the loyalty of its members, and it will be dismissed as nothing more than an irrelevant social club with no meaning for the 21st century. Martin Luther King sought to teach us that the church cannot privatize religion, that our platform cannot be used just for individual success, but that platform, that pulpit, that podium is to be used to elevate an entire community of people. For 23 years this year that I celebrate as pastor of Triumph Church, We've not only sought to worship God, but more importantly, we sought to demonstrate that our worship to God ought to be demonstrated by what we're willing to do for our community and what we're willing to do for our fellow man. And so I take my hat off and I readily receive this tremendous honor because whenever somebody uh, sees something substantive, serious and sincere, but most of all spiritual uh, that you are trying to do uh, in order to make this world a better place, I certainly uh, stand ready to partner with them. And I stand ready to partner and support uh, this leadership and this institute in any way I can as we work together, because that's the only way we can do it. We do it together to move this thing forward. Thank you so much, Reverend Solomon W. Kenlag Jr., Senior Pastor of Triumph Church and one of the most important voices in this era of the Black Lives Matter movement from the clergy. Uh, it is not an accident. Uh, we deliberately chose, uh, Reverend Ken Lack will tell you this, we deliberately chose April 5th, uh, the day after the anniversary of Dr. King's assassination to launch uh, this Black Church lecture series. Again, to those who are tuning in all the way from the United Kingdom, around the nation, right here in Detroit. I, I don't wanna uh, forget Flint. I wanna give a shout out to Flint, Michigan. I know you're in the house. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, as we proceed, um, uh, we're going to have some highlights this evening, only appropriate to do so because uh, this is part of the roots of the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, the spirituals, uh, you know, th those songs of protest uh, that gave our ancestors, our forefathers and foremothers, uh, gave them the strength and the will to continue to persevere despite, despite the contrary. So we've reached out and they accepted, readily accepted our invitation. Plymouth United Church of Christ, uh, Renaissance Choir at Plymouth United Church of Christ. The senior pastor is the Reverend Nicholas Hood III. Uh, the choir there, the Renaissance Choir, uh, is going to render some spirituals for us uh, here as we make our way to uh, the keynote speaker this evening, the Reverend Dr. Frederick Douglas Haynes, uh, who himself is a definition of liberation theology in action. And you're going to see the man who was called upon to offer uh, the special prayer, the National Cathedral in 2013, when Nelson Mandela died. You're going to see Reverend Freddie Haynes in action, an internationalist and an activist and a minister of the gospel. Plymouth United Church of Christ Renaissance Choir led by uh, the University of Michigan School of Music trained minister of music, uh, Lamar Willis. Let's take a listen now to Plymouth United Church of Christ here. In the Lord, in the Lord, the souls been anchored in the Lord. Oh, nothing left. 
Thank you so much, uh, the Renaissance Choir at Plymouth United Church of Christ for uh, that rendition. That's just the first, um, that's just to get, you, um, get your uh, appetite going for tonight's uh, Black Church Lecture Series uh, lunch here. Uh, we're going to move into uh, the Black Church is not an island. It does not stand on its own. And there are lots of forces uh, within the larger community who understand uh, the importance and the significance of the Black Church. And that is being reaffirmed this evening with community reflections. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Lewis James, who's the president and CEO of Seal Energy, uh, uh, talking about uh, what the Black Church means and how his success as a Black business uh, would not have taken place uh, without the support of the Black Church. So we're going to hear a reflection now on the significance of this forum tonight from Lewis James, the president and CEO of SEAL. Solutions for Energy Efficient Logistics, also known as SEAL, is a national energy program implementation contractor that is committed to saving energy and advancing our partners' specified renewable and clean energy targets. We design, implement, and manage effective energy management programs. SEAL is certified as a minority business enterprise. In the community, SEAL has done our part to ensure our employees and the families that we support are safe. COVID-19 impacted our country greatly, but our commitment to community and the support of others remained steady. 
SEAL supported PPE contributions to nonprofits, supported the operational expenses of our community partners, supported initiatives with faith-based and community organizations during this trying time. We cannot wait to resume support options like the American Cancer Society Walks for Breast Cancer, the local police department's National Night Out, and the face-to-face -face gatherings in the communities where we live, work, and play. Thank you, Bankale. Uh, this is a wonderful initiative and it's so greatly needed in our community. Also, I want to acknowledge everyone involved, Dr. Freddie Haynes, Senator Peters, my friend Jerry Narcia, and a huge congratulations to Pastor Solomon Kenlock for championing this worthy cause. As we talk about the role of black churches in the community, the black church is the foundation of our community. It has always been there. Uh, I think it's so important that we kind of uh, get back to where we came from and make sure that it, we allow it to give us the stability. That's what we got from the black church. Uh, I mean, we got education from there uh, and our discipline. And we kind of need all of that as we move forward uh, in trying to overcome poverty and trying to uh, overcome some of the great catastrophes that we've had this year. The black pastors, black ministers have always been there for the community. And we just got to step back and step back up to how we work together to make sure that we meet the needs of the community that we all love and belong to. You know, SEAL, uh, the company that I own, uh, started out, its foundation was with the black churches. Uh, when we got our first contract, uh, we went to the community. We went out and we made sure that we did outreach in the black churches first. And over 25 to 30 churches committed to support us. We used them to uh, uh, find the employees. We used them to help us to train. Uh, they allowed us even Sunday mornings sometimes to come and uh, uh, introduce what we were doing in the space of energy to our potential workforce. So our whole workforce is grounded in the church and they have just been a tremendous uh, plus for us uh, as we move forward. The Post Institute and Pastor Kim Lock, who's leading this initiative uh, is invaluable to the community that we serve and represent. Uh, we have to acknowledge where we have issues, we have to be responsible for those situations, and we have to solve the problems. As I said earlier, when you bring the total community together, that is the business community, the political community, and the churches, we can make anything work. So uh, the Post Institute has continued to deal with poverty, and we have to accept that that's a real problem in our community. Poverty is for real. And we just have to step back, as I said, and step back up and handle and support uh, Pulse, Pastor Kimlock, as they move forward with this initiative. I want to congratulate the Pulse Institute and Banker Lee Thompson, and especially Pastor Kimlock, in taking on this initiative. Uh, we understand that it's a lot, but Stepping up to the table, being responsible, even though you have all of these other issues and commitments to make, this is just, uh, it makes it easy for me to support this effort. And I look forward to continuing that. Thank you so much, uh, Lois James. Lois E. James, President and CEO of SEAL. It is good to see uh, black business owners, uh, entrepreneurs who give credit to their success to the black church, uh, important enough to, uh, to demonstrate that here this evening. Uh, from the political equation, uh, one of the questions we've asked in this era is uh, the linkage between Black Lives Matter, this era, and the black church. Uh, we've seen 
you know, we're in the second, perhaps uh, the second trial, second week of the trial of the historic trial of George Floyd, uh, raised a lot of questions around criminal justice reform, around issues of policing in the black community. Uh, of course, hence the Black Lives Matter movement that we saw all around the nation. Uh, much of what we are demanding will have to be laid at the feet of the federal government. And here to give remarks is United States Senator Gary Peters, who is the chairman of the Senate Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee, an important panel in this era of the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, Senator, United States Senator Gary Peters. Hello everyone, I'm US Senator Gary Peters. I wanna thank Bankale Thompson and the entire team at the Pulse Institute for not only putting together this lecture series, but for consistently shining a greater light on the need for positive social change and ways to address poverty in our community. I also wanna recognize Reverend Dr. Frederick Haynes, who will be the keynote for this year's first lecture. Dr. Haynes has been an incredible and inspirational leader across the globe who has championed economic rights and opportunities for all people. And finally, I'm pleased that this lecture series will be named after Pastor Solomon Kinlock, who I'm so proud to call a friend. Pastor Kinlock has grown Triumph Church so that it inspires thousands of people through its teachings and community outreach each and every day. His uplifting and spiritual message to his congregation about empowering oneself and forming a true connection with one's soul and spirit embodies the values of the black church. His close-knit relationship with his congregation is one that I saw up close when I joined him for conversation last year on the pressing issues facing our society. Pastor Kinlock recognizes that uplifting people's souls is the true path to success both individually and within society. We are so lucky to have him here in Detroit, and I will continue to rely on his guidance during my work in the Senate. While we've made progress in the fight for social and economic justice, we know that already existed in racial health and economic disparities, but we must close those gaps. And that's exactly what I'll keep doing here in the U.S. Senate. Because nobody, based on where you live, should be denied access to quality, affordable health care. Nobody, because of your zip code, should be forced to live in polluted neighborhoods that lead to personal health and environmental hazards. And nobody, nobody, should be forced to live in poverty despite working full-time job to make ends meet. That's why it's past time that we raise the minimum wage to a livable wage. And I'm so glad the Pulse Institute will be delving into these and other challenges that we still face through these lectures. These conversations are vital as we make progress. So thank you again and enjoy the rest of the discussion. All right, thank you so much, uh, U.S. Senator uh, Gary Peters, uh, Democrat from Michigan, Chairman of the Senate Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee. Uh, he is speaking about the importance, but also to uh, Pastor Solomon Kenlock's leadership. Our next remark will come from the business community. Um, several days ago, and I, in fact, wrote this in my Detroit News column about uh, the late Reverend Leon Sullivan, uh, an activist, a social activist, a civil rights leader, and a minister in Philadelphia. The late Reverend Leon Sullivan was the senior pastor of the Zion Baptist Church in Philadelphia. And it was the largest black church in Philadelphia at the time. And Reverend Sullivan uh, took, upon it, took upon himself uh, the need to address uh, the challenges facing black folk, not only in Philadelphia, but around the country. He challenged corporations and he worked with them to do good. When he got on GM's board of directors, right away he formed an alliance with Nelson Mandela. And in fact, Nelson Mandela would later recognize that when it was lonely, it was men like Reverend Leon Sullivan who forced corporations to divest from the racist apartheid regime. It was Reverend Leon Sullivan who is responsible for a lot of black dealers and suppliers in the automotive industry to call themselves proud business entrepreneurs in the auto industry because of the seed that he planted. So there's a history here in our community in terms of the nexus between business and the black church. And so for remarks on that here is Jerry Nocio, 
is the president and CEO of DT Energy, one of the Fortune 500 companies here in Michigan, uh, speaking uh, to the essence of this series and to the essence of Pastor Ken Lark's leadership. Take a listen from Jerry Nosia, the president and CEO of DT Energy from Michigan. Hello, I'm Jerry Norcia, President and CEO of DTE Energy. I'm honored to join you to celebrate the kickoff of the Pulse Institute's Black Church Lecture Series and to congratulate Reverend Solomon Kinlock for his tremendous work and commitment to the black community. COVID-19 has affected everyone, but we know it has had a disproportionate and devastating impact on the health and livelihoods of people of color and people living in poverty. Repairing this damage and making progress toward our ultimate goal of eliminating racism and poverty will require unprecedented public-private partnerships to create systemic and sustainable change. I'm thankful to Bank Olay Thompson and the Pulse Institute for providing a forum like this to promote further collaboration, conversation, and support. I applaud Reverend Kinlock for his unwavering leadership and generosity to those most in need. During the pandemic, Reverend Kinlock helped galvanize the business community and his church served as a safe place for people to get food, COVID testing, and other much needed resources. My experience growing up as a son of Italian immigrants is one of the many reasons why I believe we all need to work together to help create prosperity and wealth for one another. My father was a bricklayer and my mother was a hospital custodian. We were poor, but my parents were determined that my brother and I would have an education and opportunities they never had. At DTE, we understand that we need to work with our churches of providing people with access to education, skills, and opportunities is the key to creating economic prosperity in our communities. We need to help people get to work by equipping them with skills in high demand skilled trades and jobs in science, technology, engineering, and math. We have many different community initiatives in conjunction with our partners to support these efforts. We will also need to provide education, a prerequisite for job training. This past year, DT was extremely proud to be an active partner in Connected Futures, providing tablets and high-speed internet access to every student in Detroit. And I know that Reverend Kinlock also participated in this effort. Connected Futures is an example of a public-private partnership coming together to do what Detroit does best, solve problems and create new opportunities. And last, we know we need to help people in the moment of crisis. DTE partnered with Reverend Kinlock in the depths of the pandemic on keeping the energy flowing for thousands of people by offering support like our low-income self-sufficiency programs to those who needed it the most. We are proud to continue this work with all of you to combat poverty, denounce racism, and stand united as a force for positive change and justice in our communities. Thank you and God bless. All right. Um, thank you so much to Jerry Nosia, the president and CEO of DT Energy. Again, thank you all for being here. Uh, this is the launch of the National Black Church Lecture Series here from the Motor City, from the nation's largest African American city. Again, I'm Ben Colley Thompson, the editor in chief and dean of the Pulse Institute. On behalf of our president, Attorney Tina M. Patterson, one of the few, let me emphasize, few black women to head a major think tank of this magnitude in the nation. And we are glad launching the Reverend Solomon Kenlock Lecture Series on Social Policy and Economic Justice. Uh, there's a lot of questions being raised, a lot of questions being raised. And tonight, we're trying to answer some of those difficult questions that men like the late Reverend Kane Hope Felder, the longtime dean of Howard University asked questions that the late James Cohn from the Union Theological Seminary asked questions that uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu raised as the spiritual father of the anti-apartheid movement. And so tonight uh, we're going to have a keynote speaker, one who, uh, in my opinion, is the definition of liberation theology in action. That in fact, you know, the idea of the church and the community are not antithetical concepts, but they are mutually inclusive. Before I ask Reverend Solomon Kenlack to do us the justice of appropriately introducing our keynote speaker, the inaugural speaker, to, to formally launch this lecture series open, 
Uh, we're going to have another musical here from Clement United Church of Christ, uh, Renaissance Choir. And right after uh, Reverend Ken Lack's introduction, uh, Plymouth United Church of Christ is going to sing Precious Lord, uh, which is Dr. King's song. And in fact, there's a lot of history with that with the late Mahalia Jackson. But let's go with Plymouth, right after Plymouth United Church of Christ Renaissance Choir presentation here. Uh, Reverend Ken Lack would introduce the Reverend Dr. Frederick Douglass Haynes III. And right after his introduction, Precious Lord by Plymouth United Church of Christ. And then we'll have our keynote speaker, Reverend Dr. Frederick Douglass Haynes. So let's go with Plymouth. Sooner we'll be done with the troubles of the world, the troubles of the world, the troubles of the world. Sooner we'll be done with the troubles of the world, going home to live with God. Sooner we'll be done with the troubles of the world, the troubles of the world, the troubles of the world. Sooner we'll be done with the troubles of the world, going home to live with Jesus. 
thank you so much, Plymouth United Church of Christ uh, Renaissance Choir, where Reverend Nicholas Hood III sits as a senior pastor. Thank you for being a part of this series this evening, the launching of the Black Church Lecture Series, named after Reverend Kenlock. I'm going to ask Reverend Solomon Kenlock to now introduce our keynote speaker, after which we'll have one more rendition from Renaissance Choir at Plymouth, and then Dr. Haynes will address us. Where will we be? without a gospel song. Thank God for that tremendous music that has been rendered thus far. It gives me a humble privilege uh, to be able to present tonight because he really needs no introduction. Even the devil in hell know who Reverend Dr. Frederick Douglass Haynes III is. I was a 15 year old preacher uh, sitting on the pulpit at the New Bethel Baptist Church under the tutelage and teaching of Reverend Robert Smith Jr. on Linwood and now C.O. Franklin Drive where our men's day speaker that morning was the youthful, dynamic, energetic, anointed uh, Reverend Frederick Haynes III. Uh, he stood up and had the mind, he had the intellect, he had the academic preparation, he had the anointing of God, he had the homiletical and hermeneutical ability to make the words of the prophetic book leap from the page and become relevant and applicable in the life of everybody in that room. In other words, that day I was blown away. And since that day till now, he ceases uh, every time uh, to live up uh, and not only live up, but exceed the expectation of anyone that has the blessed privilege of hearing him preach. I am honored when I think of all of the individuals uh, that could articulate the gospel, not just with substance, but with soul, uh, because he not only has the learning, he has the burning uh, to make that word uh, real in the life of God's people. He is a prophetic pastor. He's a passionate leader. He's a social activist. He's an eloquent orator. He's an educator. He is engaged in preaching the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, fighting against racial injustice, committed to economic justice and empowerment in the underserved community and touching, transforming the lives of the disenfranchised. For 37 years and more, Dr. Haynes has served as a visionary and innovative senior pastor of Friendship West Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas. Under his serving leadership, the ministry and the membership has grown from 100 to more than 12,000, and even in the midst of the pandemic, still counting. Uh, if any preacher was to suggest uh, that they don't have a little bit, and a lot of us got a lot of Dr. Frederick Haynes in us, they are lying and the truth is not in them. He is one of God's foremost anointed gospel preachers. And I'm thankful uh, that he has been a model and a prototype for those of us that are preaching the gospel to follow. Uh, he not only understands the worship, but he understands that we as a preacher has a responsibility and as a church to do the work and looking out for those who cannot look out for themselves. I introduce to some, but I present to other as a great and humble privilege, the reverend Dr. Frederick Douglas Hayes III, he is the man. <laughs> wow. Wow. I'm uh, absolutely blown away. Dr. Haynes, hold on, hold on, hold on. My bad, my bad. Sorry. Ho hold on, hold on. Let's, let's, let, let's lead you in with precious Lord. So, oh Plymouth Renaissance oh, Choir, take it. Okay. I'm tired. 
to appreciatively applaud and lovingly laud both uh, Tina Patterson and Bankole Thompson for your uh, sterling and visionary leadership. I thank you for establishing a motto uh, that the rest of us in the country uh, need to not only emulate, uh, but execute. Uh, it has been just a blessed privilege of mine to uh, do some research on the Pulse Institute uh, after I received this invitation. And I am just completely blown away, uh, though not surprised, uh, that you are courageously and creatively uh, opening the door to a new era when it comes to the economic empowerment of people who have been oftentimes politically pimped and so I thank you so much for uh, your courage, your creativity, your innovation, 
and for the way that you have inspired my own ministry and witness uh, here in Dallas, uh, especially going forward. I especially want to appreciatively applaud you for recognizing the brilliant ecclesiology of one Solomon W. Kinlock Jr. Jesus said that a prophet is not without honor in his own home and country because the sad reality is we often overlook, take for granted and ignore those gifts of genius that are planted right in our backyard. And you have in Detroit, as far as I'm concerned, the most brilliant ecclesiologist, pastor, preacher in the United States today. When it's said that he has one of the fastest growing churches, black churches in the uh, nation. No, he has the fastest growing black church in the nation. Uh, no one is doing it like uh, Pastor Solomon Kinlock. And if I had to do it all over again, uh, I would ask God, let me grow up uh, behind Solomon Kinlock so that when I grow up, I could be just like him. Because how he is doing ministry uh, is the way that we've got to do it, uh, especially in the 21st century. And so uh, I salute him. Uh, he stands as one of my heroes and uh, his, what, hyperbolic uh, introduction of me uh, caused me to pray deeply for him because I had to pray that God would forgive him uh, for his hyperbolic lying. And then I prayed that God would forgive me because I love the way he lied about me. So uh, I appreciate him. I applaud him. I admire him. And I thank God for what you are doing. Y'all know I love Detroit. And so my only regret is that I'm not doing this in Detroit, uh, but I thank God for uh, what goes down in Motown. Uh, I love this, the Reverend Solomon W. Kenlock lecture series on church influence on social equity and economic injustice. I've been asked to do a lecture and what was jacked up and I need to pray for y'all about this. Y'all put me up behind precious Lord. That's what you call in the black church. And Kenlock, you know this, that, that's called the hymn of preparation uh, where you know next up is the sermon. Ain't no lecture after precious Lord. So, so I'm praying for y'all because y'all done set me up and I'm gonna do my best to lecture uh, and, and, and be obedient to the dictates of what you have uh, set up. But thank God for the amazing, wonderful ministry of uh, Plymouth uh, United Church of Christ. I had the privilege along with Dr. R Jeremiah Wright preaching there a number of years. So it's a blessing to uh, again uh, be in their presence. Uh, I want to label this lecture King and Kenlock, colon, Theology and Ecclesiology for an economic revolution, King and Kinlock, theology and ecclesiology for an economic revolution. And I should say a liberating theology for an ecclesiology for an economic revolution. That phenomenal prophet, Jesse Jackson, used insightful imagery and a teaspoon of terms to portray a ton of truth. When he sagaciously suggested, if you have a size 10 foot shoe and you've been forced to wear a size 10 foot, but you've been forced to wear a size eight shoe, the pain is the result of a structural problem. I'll do that one more time. Reverend Jesse Jackson said, if you have a size 10 foot, but you are forced to wear a size eight shoe, of course, you're going to experience pain. The pain you experience is the result of a structural problem. The outcome of black pain in these disunited states of America is the result of an unjust structure that has been rooted in COVID-16-19 that my sisters and brothers has been exposed afresh 
via COVID-19. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the drum major for justice, spent the last years of his liberating and luminous life challenging the American empire to redo a structure that was causing the pain of poverty. Yeah, this shoe hurts. Cornel West said that for Martin King, poverty was a barbaric form of tyranny that was to be banished from the earth. That great preacher prophet, Dr. James Forbes says that, that poverty is a weapon of mass destruction. So y'all ain't feeling Forbes and Cornel West. Let me go with, uh, who is it? Jay-Z, Jay puts it like this. We ain't doing crime for the sake of doing crime. We moving dimes cause we ain't doing fine. I hope you get it because Jay, if I remix him was saying before you judge our criminal choices, you need to be aware of the crime that has limited our options. Well, y'all didn't feel Jay, so I got to go to Detroit's own Big Sean. Big Sean, holla at us. Big Sean poetically raps about environmental justice, abusive policing, and economic injustice. Check out Big Sean when Big Sean talks about kids who get sick with lead. Others get hit with the lead from where they need a hand out, but they tell you put hands up. An unjust and racist structure has created unhealthy environments that preclude possibilities. We must not only empower people, we've got to transform environments. I hope y'all are getting this, the shoe hurts. Ta-Nehisi Coates, that amazing author, wrote an article that punctuates and illustrates this idea. President Barack Obama was speaking with young men who had benefited from mentoring programs, and he asked these young men whether they had a message that he should take back to policymakers in Washington, D.C., and one young brother boldly and brilliantly observed that despite their best individual efforts, they still had to go back to the very same deprived neighborhoods that had been sources of trouble for them. The young man said to President Obama, it's your environment. You can do what you want, but you still got to go back to the hood, back in the hood where Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five said it's like a jumble. Sometimes it make, makes me wonder how I keep from going under. <laughs> Don't push me because I'm close to the edge. I'm trying not to lose my head. Check it. What Grandmaster Flash, what that young man was saying is that the environment, the structure, the shoe, it causes the pain. Y'all, they correct. The ghettos of America are the direct result of decades of public policy decisions. The redlining of real estate zoning maps, the expanded authority given to prosecutors, the increased funding given to prisons, and all of this was done on the backs of people, Black people still reeling from a 250-year legacy of slavery. The results of this negative investment are clear. The shoe hurts. African-Americans rank at the bottom of nearly every major socioeconomic measure in the country. I'm gonna say it again. The shoe hurts for those who have the unmitigated gall to espouse family values, but they don't fight for policies that value the family. You can't simply address the issue of family when speaking of poverty. Families live in communities around other families in neighborhoods that have been constructed by policies. You can't ignore policies that undermine communities that in turn hurt families. So it's very important that, it, that we take a good look at our theology as we address the problem of poverty. And may we have a liberating theology that will emancipate our ecclesiology so we can transform our sociology. Preach Freddie Haynes, I'm not trying to do that. So let me slow it down by simply talking about the theology of poverty that we must be mindful of. Dean John Kenney, the brilliant Dr. John Kenney, the Dean Emeritus of the Samuel DeWitt Proctor School of Theology at 
uh, Virginia Union University has challenged us to be liberated from plantation theology. I'll do it again. Liberated from plantation theology. Too many black churches in the 21st century are wedded to, no, locked up by, handcuffed by what Dean calls a plantation theology. Dean Kenny simply reasons that how you gonna trust the theology of a people who have concocted, they have created a white Jesus that sanctioned slavery, upheld Jim Crow while being wedded to the oppressive policies of the American empire. Why are you gonna get in bed with the white Jesus who uh, who causes you to be in a real sense wrapped up in personal piety that is divorced from public policy. We must be liberated from plantation theology. You see, the God who sides with the oppressed in scripture has a preferential option for the impoverished. And check this, God is going to judge nations based on how they treat the least of these. Let me remember my Lord and liberator, that resurrected revolutionary Jesus the Christ, because Jesus testifies in what is it, Matthew chapter 25, that he's going to judge, please don't miss this, the nations, not individuals, he's going to judge the nations, and he's going to separate the sheep from the goats and say, I was hungry, I was thirsty, I got a remix, and I hear Jesus saying to America, I was hungry, but you cut the budget for aid to dependent children, chip and food stamps. I was thirsty and you contaminated water in Flint, Michigan and other impoverished communities. I was in prison because of mass incarceration and your criminal justice system that criminalizes and otherizes blackness. You locked me up for crack cocaine addiction while declaring a public health crisis for those on opioids. I was a stranger and you you built a wall. Jesus, y'all, my resurrected revolutionary was born homeless, grew up in a hood. His hood was so hood that I believe that I, that I believe that if uh, NWA was rapping around that time, they'd have a hit album called Straight Out of Nazareth. He grew up in the hood in Nazareth after watch this being a refugee in Egypt because he was born under a death public policy that had been issued by Herod. So he grew up in the hood, hung out in the streets, majored in ministry to the marginalized and ran with a crew that most people didn't think much of. You see, heaven's hero and earth's emancipator gave healing to hurting people with pre-existing conditions who could not afford premiums. He transformed grief-stricken funeral processions into to festive family reunions. My Jesus took a two piece and five biscuits, Jeffrey Johnson would say, and fed those who were food secure in the wilderness. You see, our sable skinned savior from the streets did all of this for those who were imprisoned by impoverishment in an oppressive environment of economic exploitation because of the public policies of the Roman Empire. Jesus, my sisters and brothers, outlines for us his own revolutionary agenda by, um, he outlines for us, I'm sorry, our revolutionary agenda so we can break out of this shoe that hurts us in his own vision, vision and mission statement. Y'all know that vision and mission statement because Jesus goes home to Nazareth and you know what he says, the spirit of the Lord God is a upon me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor, set the captives free, heal those who are brokenhearted, open the eyes of those who are blind, deliver those who are uh, uh, downtrodden, and proclaim the year of economic justice. I hope y'all are getting it. That basically, my sisters and brothers, is what I call a liberating theology and ecclesiology for an economic revolution. And that's what
what the ministry of our Savior, the ministry of King and Kenlock are all about. You see, we are called in this Kairos Kairos moment. It's the Kairos moment because it's the day after Resurrection Sunday, which is also the anniversary of the assassination of the drum major for justice as well as the anniversary of his speech denouncing the war in Vietnam and economic exploitation. And it's this day, April the 5th, that we are having the inauguration of this Kinlock lecture series. This is a Kairos moment. We can't miss what God is up to in this moment. We've got to embrace a liberating theology that unleashes an economic revolution that empowers the oppressed and restructures this nation so that the shoes fit our feet. You see, it's in our black church history. Y'all had the gospel gall to talk about the black church in this. I'm grateful for that because when I'm talking about the black church, I'm not talking about churches with black people trying to emulate and imitate white people. I'm talking about the black church, the black church that was born according to my friend and brother, Senator Reverend Dr. Raphael Wardnock. It was born as a protest movement. I'm talking about the black church that according to Dr. Henry H. Mitchell was born where every black preacher used her or his pulpit as a platform for abolition. They connected what was going on inside of the worship experience in the church with what was going on in the lives of the people outside of the church after the benediction. I'm talking about the black church that L.H. Welcho called a church that was born as a protest movement. I'm talking about the black church that was born as an incubator for educational uplift and economic development. Many of our HBCUs were born not accidentally, but providentially, poetically, and prophetically where in the black church, but not just, not just educational uplift. I'm talking about economic development. It was the black church that gave rise to our societies, societies when we could not get insurance from white insurance companies. Black churches had their members to pool their pennies and brought together their resources and created our own societies. The black church has that kind of liberating theology and empowering ecclesiology. And that is what the black church must recapture if we are going to be about what God is calling us to be about. So what does that look like? I'll give y'all these things and I'll wrap it up. Number one, Dr. King and Pastor Kimlock challenge us to give prophetic shine to those who've been thrown shade because they're sentenced to the shadows. I like that. Both King and Kinlock challenge us to give prophetic shine to those who thrown, who've been thrown shade because they're sentenced to the shadows. Solomon Kinlock, he pastors, again, the fastest growing black church in the country. Solomon Kinlock has a church on a beltway where he has, I don't know how many services every weekend, how many services during the course of the week. And we all know that middle-class black folk in Detroit and the suburbs, they, they flood those church facilities on the Detroit beltway. But you know what Solomon Kinlock does? Solomon Kinlock continues to shine a spotlight and challenges his church to render services to the least of these. The middle class at Triumph are continuously challenged to minister to those on the margins. That's what Kinlock does. What did King do? In one of his last speeches, Dr. King addressed the faculty, students, and staff at Stanford University in 1967. Guess what his address was entitled? He's at Stanford University. In 
Palo Alto, California, an upper class, upper crust community, but his lecture was entitled The Other America. With prophetic boldness and elegant eloquence, the drum major for justice spoke to the predominantly white audience about the other America. He was addressing those whose America was overflowing with the milk of prosperity and the honey of opportunity, but he put the pro prophetic spotlight on the America where citizens live in third world conditions and what is supposed to be a first class country. The America does, the other America does severe damage, I should say, to children who have clouds of inferiority forming in their mental skies, the dispossessed of this nation, the poor, both white and Negro, according to King, live in a cruelly unjust society. King diagnosed that America was a country where you had socialism for the rich and free enterprise for the poor. The late great Dr. William Augustus Jones remixed it and simply called it where a nation where pleasure is autocratic and only pain is democratic. James Baldwin brilliantly stated that if you've ever struggled with poverty, you know how expensive it is to be poor. You are placed on a treadmill that rotates faster than you can catch up. One is victimized economically a thousand ways. So I quote Jesse Jackson again, you have tax cuts for the rich, but you have fees for the poor. David Halberston then traveled with King for 10 days and wrote, King has has decided to represent the hood, the ghettos. He's going to work with them and speak for them, but their voice is harsh and their voice is alienated. Please don't miss what Halberston said. He said, if King is to speak for them truly, then his voice must reflect their voice. It too must be alienated and it is likely to be increasingly at odds with the rest of American society. Remix it, Freddie Haynes. Once you decide to shine spotlight and, and ensure that those who've been thrown shade because of economic exploitation and because of the financial setbacks that they have experienced because the shoe of economic exploitation and injustice is, 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 can I use a word in from the hood, scrunching their feet. If, if, if we're going to actually hear their voice, according to Halberston, we've got to take on their voice, their voices that are alienated. And we will soon discover that when we do that, our voices will become increasingly at odds with the rest of American society. Let me illustrate it simply with this. In the movie Selma, I hope you saw it, there's an enlightening scene from the darkness of a dank jail cell. Dr. King is sharing the cell with Ralph W. Ralph Abernathy. And Abernathy wants to keep King encouraged. And so he says to Martin, Martin, keep your eyes on the prize. Martin King responded, what prize? What good is it to integrate a lunch counter if you can't afford to buy a burger? Mm. And you can't read the menu. What is King saying? King is talking about the sad reality that he had come to understand as he was struggling to integrate America or desegregate America that if you can't afford to buy a burger, I'm gonna take it a step further. If you can't afford to own that lunch counter, if you can't read the that you find yourself, here it is in shoes, shoes that are too small and create pain, economic, social pain. And that's what we're dealing with. Please don't forget Dr. King died organizing the poor people's campaign and we are called to be the continuation of the incarnation of the king of kings Jesus the Christ therefore we are called to organize like king did like Jesus did organize the disadvantage into communities for social and economic change you see kings that it lacks the drama of protest marches but it is necessary
necessary for meaningful results, we must challenge middle-class Black folk, King said, to join this struggle because too often middle-class Black folk are more concerned with conspicuous consumption than they are about the cause of justice. We've got to make sure that we take the shoes off and wear shoes that fit our feet, but we can't do that until we shine a spotlight on those who have been relegated to the shadows because they've been thrown shade because of economic injustice and economic exploitation. There's a second thing, and that is Dr. King and Ken Lott exhort and by example show us that we've got to have the anointed audacity and creative courage to serve as dissenters and the conscience of a nation that must undergo a radical reconstruction of its structure. I got to put it like this, a speech you don't hear often, Martin King gave in 1967, one of his last speeches. It was his last speech as president of the Southern Christian Leadership Con Conference. And he closed out that speech by lifting up Pastor Kenlock, that passage in John chapter three, where Jesus had a man visit him by night by the name of Nicodemus. And according to Martin King, he remixes it and says that when Nicodemus said, yo, G, evidently you are one who has been sent from God because can't nobody do what you do unless God is with them. Jesus said, Nicodemus, Nick, you got to be born again. Your structure is wrong. And until your structure is reconstructed, you will not enter the kingdom. Dr. King then went ahead to apply it by saying to America, America, you must be born again. Your structure is wrong. Your structure continues to produce the outcomes of pain, suffering, and impoverishment. And so understand a nation that spends billions of dollars policing the world as a ruling empire needs to spend billions of dollars putting the impoverished on their feet economically. The structure is broken. The shoe is hurting. You have systems that continue to produce racist results. And so Dr. King said poverty is a form of social violence. Poverty is a structural pillar of a capitalist society. And he called for a radical restructuring of the architecture of American society. You're not going to like this, but Dr. King was challenging America to move toward what he called a democratic socialism. This democratic socialism calls for an economy that is more person-centered than property and profit-centered. It's a democratic socialism where our government must long, no longer depend on, watch this, its military power, but instead it must develop a moral power. Why? Because we live in a country where Martin's message is so appropriate today. We make up as a people 13% of the American population, yet we are nearly 27% percent of those in poverty and more than 40 percent of those homeless who are houseless living in shelters according to census data black folk are about three times more likely than white folk to experience houselessness the only group that comes close are native americans who are about two times more likely to experience houselessness and so my dear sisters and brothers we are challenged to recognize is that whenever there is disproportionality that is so stark as what we have just quoted to you, it's because the structure, the shoe hurts, the shoe is producing outcomes and the outcomes are not the result of bad choices of individuals. It's not the result of people who are lazy. It's the result of a structure, a shoe that is hurtful, a shoe that is not good for our economic economic feet. And so what must we do? We must do what the Solomon Kinlocks do. What does Kinlock do? He continues to educate our people about public policy. What does Kinlock do? He speaks truth to power because he recognizes that it is high time for us to what? Experiencing America being re 
born, I'm not coming through. Uh, you saw the movie Hidden Figures. There's a sad scene of a, in the movie of a protest going on against segregation in Virginia across the street. A brother, black man, ignores the protest and drinks from the inferior colored water fountain. He stayed in his place and drank the water. Don't miss this. Y'all, we have a choice. We have a choice. Are we gonna be creative dissenters? who protest and call for a radical restructuring of this nation, or are we going to keep drinking the polluted, toxic water of this American democracy that is filled with hypocrisy? You see, King was out to cripple the operation of an oppressive society until it was ready to listen to the cries of the impoverished. There must be, here it is, there must be a better distribution of wealth and maybe America needs to move toward this democratic socialism. Here is King, he said, we have left the realm of constitutional rights and we are entering the area of human rights. The constitution assures the right to vote, but there is no such assurance of the right to adequate housing or the right to an annual income. Dr. King goes on to say it's morally right to insist every person have a decent house and adequate education and enough money to provide the basic necessities for one's family. We have to have that kind of vision and that kind of anointed audacity. I think I'll give it to y'all like this. I won't forget when I moved into my first apartment I put up a dresser drawer that I put together. I had to put it together myself and I thought I was finished. But when I finished, I noticed there were pieces to the drawer that were spread out on the floor. Check it out. All the pieces were supposed to be used, but screws and bolts and three pieces of wood were not a part of the structure I had put together. The mirror that was to connect to the back of the dresser drawer, watch this, it tilted backwards. Why did it tilt backwards? Because the directions were well written. They were written like the Constitution and Declaration of Independence. But even though the directions were well written, I had left out some parts and now the mirror revealed that the missing parts were necessary for the structure to be stable. If America is to be stable, we have to ensure that the entire structure has all of the parts. And when all of the parts are working, it's because we have restructured a nation that was structured without us to begin with, even though, to quote my girl, uh, Angela Rye, we built this joint for free, I quit with this last point. And that is, we must insist on repairs for black people broken by the American nightmare. You know I wouldn't come to Detroit and not bring up reparations. The city of John Conyers and not bring up reparations. You see, America was built by black people and white folk reaped the benefits. And I'm not just talking about slavery. We know about slavery. But even dating back, my sisters and brothers, to the 1700s, this country used the government, and, and, and that's the hypocrisy of those on the right who want smaller government. They want smaller government now, but small, but, but big government gave them the advantage that they have. Y'all, dating back to the late 1700s, the United States government gave assistance to white people in order to help them advance. The 1790 Naturalization Act was legislation that allowed only free whites to become naturalized US citizens from 1790 to 1868, 10 million European immigrants were allowed to become U.S. citizens before Black people who were born in this country. The Social Security Act of 1935, it gave a safety net. It gave a safety net for workers guaranteeing that after they retired, they would continue to get paid. But guess who that act excluded? It excluded workers of the agriculture, cultural, and domestic trade, and 60% of them were Black 
black. And that occurred until 1954 when black folk were finally included in the act. Let's go to 1830, the Indian Removal Act with the help of the US Army, Cherokee Creek and other Eastern Native American tribes were forced to relocate west of the Mississippi River to make room for white settlers where they were given land. The 1862 Homestead Act, this act gave away an overwhelming number of acreage to white settlers out west, land that had been previously settled by Native Americans. According to California Newsreel, nearly 270 million acres of Native American territory was converted to private property for white settlers. They had an economic floor foundation built under them. That's why they have old money. That's why we are where we are in this nation. And I could go on and on talking about public policies that benefited whites and disadvantaged blacks. I could go on talking about the redlining of our communities. I could go on talking about the real estate blockade that occurred that sentenced us to the ghettos where we were economically exploited. I could go on and on, but I'm simply trying to say we've got to repair the damage of 250 years of brutal dehumanizing enslavement and 100 years of legal racism. Y'all know Damn the truth. Because my Bible says that when Jesus met Zacchaeus, he said, yo, Zach, I'm coming to hang out with you. And he went to Zacchaeus' house. And when Zach was converted, and that's what America needs, a real conversion. Because when you're converted like Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus says, you know what? I done jacked over some people as a pimp for the repressive Roman Empire. And so half of my goods, I'm going to give to the poor. And everybody I jacked act around. I'm going to repair and repay them. And I'm going to give them more than double of what I took from them, what I stole from them. I've got to repair what I've broken. And we've got to have the audacity to tell America, it's time for you to repair through public policy, the hell that you have put black people through in these disunited states of America. Y'all, we can do it. After all, we got the talent. If you don't believe it, ask our NBA players from the most recent season. You know what the Milwaukee Bucks did when the Milwaukee Bucks, who were about to play a playoff game, yeah, the truth heard that a brother had been shot by the police right there in Wisconsin. The Milwaukee Bucks said, you it, talent, but you ain't going to pimp us. We're going to shut this bad boy down. We ain't playing tonight. And because they shut it down, the NBA they had to back up and when they backed up the NBA made up their mind of fresh that they were going to invest in those communities that have suffered. Why? Because the Milwaukee Bucks said, we got the talent. What we are gonna do now is shut this bad boy down. And I'm saying to black folk all over this country, we got the talent. We built this joint for free. We got the talent. We gave this nation hip hop, R&B, jazz. We got the talent. If it ain't for us, you don't have football and basketball. We got the talent. And if we decide to shut this thing down, I promise you, we can force America to repair what America has broken. We can do it. America owes it to us. But it's going to take a revolutionary theology rooted in liberation. And when we have a liberating theology, it will empower our pleology ecclesiology, I'm sorry, our ecclesiology to therefore transform the sick sociology of the United States of America. God bless you. Thank you so much to Reverend Dr. Frederick Douglass uh, Haynes III for uh, quite a stirring uh, lecture tonight slash sermon and touched on every point. And this is definitely, I said earlier on, you would see the best of liberation theology in action, the best of our tradition, and really the very, the very definition of what the historic black church has, has been in, in what he has been able to do for us tonight. 
and we are definitely honored uh, that you accepted the invitation and to be a part of this. Uh, let me go to uh, the Reverend Solomon W. Kenlag Jr., King and Kenlag. All right. <laughs> uh, for the vote of thanks as we make our way out of the, this <laughs> inaugural historic <laughs> national lecture series with the one and only Reverend Frederick Douglas Haynes, a senior pastor of the Friendship West uh, Baptist Church in Dallas. Uh, Reverend Ken Lack, I hand it over to you for the vote of thanks, then I'll move on to Attorney Patterson and we'll have a quick closing here. But um, the questions are being asked if in fact this has been recorded. Yes, we are recording this, uh, you will have it. Uh, we will blow it all over the airways. This message is needed more than ever. Uh, Detroit sure needs this message and I'm so glad that Reverend Haynes, you lifted up the spirit of uh, one of our best, uh, uh, the late Congressman John Conyers Jr. Uh, Reverend Kenlock. Well, it was preaching tonight. He certainly <laughs> spoke prophetically. He, he stood in the role of a prophet going into tomorrow, bringing us back a relevant word today. And he continues to do, and he did tonight, uh, what he has done so many times. Uh, he has blown that thing out of the water. And so I salute uh, Reverend Dr. Frederick Douglass Haynes III. I uh, take heed to the call and uh, we issue the call tonight uh, to all of God's preachers and to all of God's people uh, that it's time uh, to do uh, what he has suggested tonight, uh, to stop staying in our place and drink in the toxic water. Uh, that's the call tonight, that's the message. Uh, that none of us can afford to stay in a place and a space that others have put us in. Uh, but we have uh, to make a decision tonight that we're going to do all we can for as many people as we can for as long as we can uh, to make this world a better place. Uh, my call and my responsibility uh, is to remind those of us that bear this heavy load that we're not called just to be practical. We are called to be prophetic. And tonight, uh, I want to thank you, Bankale. I want to thank you, Tina. Uh, I want to thank you, uh, my brother and my friend, uh, Freddie Haynes, for being such a tremendous role model uh, to letting us know that real church, I heard you say it 33 years ago, that God did his best ministry through Jesus Christ, not in a building, but outside a building. And that has been the thread of my ministry. Uh, for the 23 years that I've been a pastor of Triumph Church, that the best ministry we can do is not in that wall, but it's outside those walls. And so I take heed to that call and I humbly uh, partner with you tonight to continue uh, to do all we can for as many people as we can. God bless y'all tonight. Thank you so much, Reverend Ken Lack. Uh, I wanna also indicate that in fact, uh, this series will be held periodically every three to four months. Our next uh, installation is in June, uh, so we'll be announcing the next speaker. Uh, I can already imagine it's going to be tough to come after Freddie Haynes. So, <laughs> but we'll, 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 I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll find a speaker uh, to, to, to come behind Reverend Frederick Douglas Haynes opening up this lecture series. So our next series will be in June. I'm going to move on to now to uh, Attorney Tina Patterson uh, for a closing comment, closing remarks here. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you again, Dr. Haynes for your soul stirring lecture. You said that uh, it was hard to top precious Lord, but I don't, I don't think you were telling the truth there because that was amazing. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Reverend Solomon Kenlot. We are so fortunate to have you here in Detroit. Thank you for readily agreeing to commit your name to this series and not just your name, but your legacy, your preaching and uh, the quality and and the consistency of the message that you bring. Thank you very much. Um, to our moderator, Bankale Thompson, who's always speaking truth to power, we appreciate you, thank you. Thank you for everyone that's in attendance tonight. I wanna actually close with a, a quote from Angela Davis, Angela Yvonne Davis, that reminds me of Dr. King, that reminds me of Jesus, that reminds me of all the people who are negatively, quote unquote, uh, described as radicals, uh, but who have changed the world more than anybody else that we know of in human history. And Angela Davis said, you have to act as if it were possible to radically transform the world and you have to do it all the time. That's what Dr. King did. That's what Reverend Solomon Kenlock is doing here in his community. That's what the Reverend Frederick Haynes is doing in Dallas. That's what Jesus Christ did in his time. And that's what's needed to really, to really uh, 
change what we all know is so wrong in our society, what we all know is so wrong with racism, what we all know is so wrong with poverty in our communities in the midst of great riches and wealth. So I really am appreciative of everyone who's here tonight. I thank you very much. I hope that you leave here inspired, uh, that you leave here uplifted, and that when the negativity of our day comes to you, you remember this message tonight because it is possible. There are people who are committed and it's not just word, there are actions as well. So thank you again uh, for this evening. I hope you all enjoy it. From the president here of the Pulse Institute, thank you very much. And let me add one more thing before we round up here, before we go, um, for those of you who are listeners uh, to my daily program here on the 9, 10 a.m. Superstation every day, Monday through Friday, 11 to 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I'm going, to, I'm going to play the entire lecture unabated of the Reverend Frederick Douglas Haynes this week on the radio. So for thousands of people across the state in Ohio, in Windsor, Canada, Ontario, Canada, you'll get to hear Reverend Dr. Frederick Douglas Haynes' keynote speech uh, tonight. I want to leave you all with this, something that Dr. Haynes said, creative dissenters. I, I love that. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's as if I can write a column on that. And I think that's been the, the, the overarching theme of what we do here, the right to dissent, the, to, to give the other perspective, uh, the other side of the story that is not being told. Uh, we, you know, folks are building castles up in the air they tell us Detroit is coming back while majority of the folks in the city don't see a comeback. I was listening to a speech earlier today that Dr. King gave in the United Kingdom in London, December 7th, 1964. He was on his way to receiving the Nobel Peace Prize. He stopped in London and gave a lecture that was just discovered over the last three years. In the lecture, Dr. King said a Negro in Detroit wakes up, finds out he's 28% of the population, but 72% of those who are unemployed. And I looked at that speech December 7th, 1964, flashback, April 5th, 2021, Detroit is still facing the manacles of economic injustice. And those are the kinds of issues that will be highlighted here in this lecture series. And I think uh, Dr. Haynes really brought it home tonight. And I'm glad uh, that he so eloquently, but prophetically really invoked the name of somebody who really stood tall in this town, the late Congressman John Kanyas, the Dean of Congress, the only man in living history who was endorsed by Dr. King, but also the only courageous, courageous member of Congress who had the audacity, the temerity, and, and, and the unmitigated goal to introduce HR 40, and that was the bill to study reparations. John Kanyas did that. So thank you again uh, to Reverend Haynes for invoking John Kanyas uh, in your lecture tonight. Uh, that really from, from Detroit, that meant a lot to all of us. And to all of you, again, thank you so much for being here uh, for the inaugural the inaugural uh, Reverend Solomon W. Kenlock lecture series on the Black Church and social justice. Our next installment will be in June. We will announce that shortly with the next speaker. Like I said, uh, Reverend Haynes has given us a tough assignment now. Now we have to go find to see if there is any minister willing to come behind Reverend Frederick Douglas Haynes. <laughs> Thank you so much and have a good night. And Ben Thompson.